works. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's Institute on National Affairs speaker. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to remind you all that the Institute does continue for the remainder of the week. Uh, we have a lecture tomorrow night. I hope you all got a brochure on the way in. It explains exactly what we are offering for the rest of the week. I'd like to stress tomorrow night we have Horace Newcomb speaking on TV humor. Following night, Emily Toth, I'm sorry, Daryl Dance. Emily Toth is our afternoon speaker. Daryl Dance on um, what exactly is? No, Emily Toth is the evening speaker, excuse me. Female Wits. And we're ending up the Institute this year with a performance, a second performance, following Mark Russell's performance Saturday night, of Ann Bates, uh, former editor of the National Lampoon and co-writer of Saturday Night Live. I'd like to see you all there. That'll be ending up the week for tonight. Brendan Gill has been a writer for the New Yorker magazine since his graduation from Yale in 1936. He presently serves as that magazine's film and drama critic. Among Mr. Gill's other writings are The Trouble of One House, Tallulah, and his memoirs here at the New Yorker. Of another of his works, The Ways of Loving, Kurt Vonnegut writes that he is awed and inspired by Mr. Gill's command of our language and his grasp of the subject. I'd like to have you all join me in welcoming Mr. Brendan Gill. Thank you very much, Tom, for that mercifully uh, brief uh, obituary, uh, <laughs> which uh, I like to have be kept uh, short like that. And uh, the, the, the fewer things I'm told that I've done, the, the, the happier I feel about the possibilities for the future. The, uh, one of our daughters paid me uh, or asked in the form of a question what amounted to a, uh, a characteristic daughter to father question uh, when she had read something that I had done in the papers. And she said, oh, Pop, Aren't you glad that you're peaking so late? <laughs> Are we having trouble with the mic? Adjust anything you like. Are you getting this thing? No? What's your, four score and seven years ago. <laughs> Nothing yet? I thought we did have it on. Maybe I turned it off. Right, go ahead. Now what? Keep speaking. All right. Our forefathers brought forth on this continent <laughs> a new nation. Mr. Gill, I'll, I'll try to get some of it. All right. You don't think you could hear me anyway? As I was saying when I was so rudely interrupted by a technical breakdown, now can you hear me? No. It seems to be on. Now, now can you hear me? Uh, <laughs> grave doubts in the back of the room. Uh, I was uh, astonished to, to learn uh, about the length of this conference. I can't believe that uh, anybody can go on talking about humor, or even thinking about humor, for almost a week. Um, it seems like one of the most difficult topics in the world to sustain uh, a conversation about, much less uh, a series of talks. But uh, I admire your uh, fortitude. The once, many years ago, when Wilkin Gibbs, one of our most brilliant writers on The New Yorker, uh, uh, was writing reviews, and he had to review a book of, 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 about humor. And he said of the author that Mr. So-and-so uh, had got humor down and broken her arm. Uh, and uh, that's the hazard of talking about humor. Ross, the founder of The New Yorker magazine, uh, had a dictum, uh, if you can't be funny, uh, be interesting. And so I will do my best 
That's what I always say uh, when people write in uh, to me at the magazine and criticize me for something that I've done wrong or in their eyes have done wrong. And very often it'll turn out to be that the, that the uh, author of the letter is a seven or eight year old child <coughs> <coughs> urging me to, to pull myself together. And, 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 and I always write back that I will, I will, I promise I will. Uh, my, my credentials for, for talking about humor are, I suppose, partly my, my personal history, which I fear has the, the drawback of being uh, uh, cheerful uh, rather than humorous. I'm a notoriously cheerful person, uh, and I leap out of bed every morning on the assumption that the day will prove to be the best uh, and merriest that I have ever known. Uh, this is very depressing, uh, for, uh, especially for people who do not leap out of bed. Uh, in the morning, and who find my high spirits repulsive. Uh, it should be part of my credentials for speaking out on humor that I worked for a so-called uh, humorous magazine for almost 45 years. But a humorous magazine is the last place on earth, as you might expect, uh, to look for humor in. Humorists are men who notoriously take a very dark view of life. One thinks of, of uh, Mark Twain in this regard, and perhaps you remember his remark when he was asked his opinion of the Jews, and he said, they are members of the human race. Worse than that, I cannot say of them. <laughs> and one thinks of Lardner, uh, uh, Ring Lardner, certainly, I suppose, the darkest of all our humorists, a, a miserable, miserably unhappy man. Uh, I only know one happy story about him. Apparently, no matter how bad he was feeling early in the morning, uh, having not gone to bed, much less having leapt out of bed, but having drunk all night as he did, uh, the one little joke that could make him happy was a joke that he would repeat about two men in a bar, and one man says to the other bar, where we, to the other man, where were you born? And uh, the man replied, I was born out of wedlock. And the first man said, mighty pretty country round there. <laughs> That's what it took to keep Ring Lardner from the blackest despair. And coming closer to home in my own experience, of course, there was uh, on, uh, on the New Yorker Thurber, who too was, was, uh, was uh, compact of gloom. Uh, he never had a really merry moment in his life except on those occasions when at a party or in some social occasion, uh, he was able to cause two lifelong friends to become bitter enemies. Uh, <laughs> then uh, his face assumed an expression of radiance. Uh, this was one of the few uh, satisfactions that, uh, that uh, I ever knew him to know. Uh, needless to say, uh, he and I were not friends, or not friends for long because he was always attempting to, uh, to, to break up uh, all the relationships on the magazine. He was a, a man who, however, had friends, uh, older friends than I, uh, who forgave him everything in part because uh, he was, it is true, uh, nearly blind, and uh, that is a terrifying affliction. Before he went blind, he used to wander around the corridors of the magazine writing on the walls, always the same message, too late, too late. Too late. We never knew what it was too late for. But uh, uh, for years, an attempt was made uh, to save some, not only of his drawings that he made on the walls, because he would draw on any available surface at any time, but uh, some of those messages. And uh, we would make a mark around it so the painter wouldn't paint that particular part of the wall. And of course, that was the inducement on, uh, for the painter to paint that very part of the wall, if no other part. The, uh, E.B. White, another man, uh, a dear man, a sweet man, totally unlike Thurber in his nature, but not, I would say, a very cheerful, sunny, happy man. And uh, uh, many years ago, it's still when he was in, say, in his 40s or 50s, he was under the impression uh, that something, as he said to me, something snapped in my mind. He said, just like a rubber band. Uh, he is no very great. Uh, technical prowess. He himself would be as baffled as I by the arrangements of this uh, uh, microphone. And, and uh, so his idea of what happened to him in his mind 
a rubber band is the, it was a highly technical description from his point of view. And he used to go out in his farm in Maine and, and put himself into a harness that he had devised hanging from the rafters of the barn just to rest his head because he was convinced that his head was too heavy for the rest of his body to support. And I was always terrified, of course, that he would somehow have a fainting fit or something and, and, and go and hang himself and be thought to have committed suicide when he had done no such thing. If writers on The New Yorker are, are, are gloomy, so are, in fact, are most of our artists. We call them artists and not cartoonists. That's to make them feel better. Uh, and indeed, it causes them to do better work, because if a person thinks of himself as an artist, he does do better work. Uh, but uh, Peter Arno, who was certainly one of the most gifted of, the, of artists that we ever had, and one of the funniest, was himself so dour a person, and so disagreeable and bitter a person, uh, that uh, at his funeral, uh, almost nobody, uh, I think only one person outside the family troubled to turn up at the funeral of this very great man. Charles Adams, uh, although his drawings are very uh, dark in their implications, there's always a very strong touch of, of necrophilia in everything he does, uh, nevertheless is himself, I must say, uh, capable of, uh, of laughter. Uh, he. Uh, he is, uh, would not be said to be sunny, he would be said to be sardonic, but uh, uh, is not uh, in a state of profound and continuous gloom like many of his colleagues. So there are no humorists uh, on humorous magazines, at least there's no humorist on the humorous magazine that I'm familiar with, and although I'm supposed to be speaking about magazine humor, uh, the fact is that I know little or nothing about Mad Magazine, and I know little or nothing even about the National Lampoon, with the result that you will be hearing uh, mostly about the New Yorker magazine uh, since I have been working or playing there for so long. The, the idea of humor on a humorous magazine is a little, it puts me in mind of a principle promulgated by the Duke of Wellington who had been born in Ireland and hated the Irish and didn't like to be reminded of it. And when he was reminded of it by somebody, uh, he said in a fury, Sir, a man may be born in a stable, but that doesn't make him a horse. <laughs> and and uh, the, now we're having all kinds of technical wonders. <laughs> something like a rubber band has improved inside <laughs> something. Um, what humorists are like is much more like what Patrick Kavanaugh, also an Irishman, the premier poet in Ireland after Yeats, uh, said of his peasant ancestry. He said, uh, they live in the dark cave of the unconscious, and they scream when they see the light. They scream when they see the light. And writers that I've known, as, and artists that I have known, are in effect, uh, closet exhibitionists. Uh, they want to show off, uh, but they want to remain invisible. <coughs> they want to be loved, but they don't want to be known. And so they, may, they do their work secretly, underground, like moles, and the work must stand for them. But uh, it's very treacherous activity on the part of the public that reads them or admires them uh, to take a chance on meeting any of them because it is very unlike uh, real life to discover that the man and the work are, as one always hopes they will be, one. They are rarely one. Uh, my, my cheerful disposition totally unfitted me for a career at the New Yorker, uh, but I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I was a person spoiled from birth, and uh, I recommend this condition highly. <laughs> From the very moment I came into the world, people spoiled me, and I want this to go on happening for quite a long while yet. The, uh, just from one year to the next, no matter what was going wrong in the world, it always worked out right for me. I was able to go to Yale, uh, largely because we were suffering a national depression, and uh, my father was able to pay my full tuition, which was sufficiently rare to, uh, lead me to the Haven. And uh, when I went with our elder son to speak to the Dean of Admissions at Yale a few years ago, 
And uh, the dean said to me, and what was your class? And I said, uh, class of 36. And he said, oh my God, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel on that year. <laughs> In any event, I did, as has been reported, graduate from Yale, and then I got married the next day. My wife and I were 21, and we thought we were very grown up indeed. Uh, and off we went uh, to Europe on our honeymoon, where, as I mentioned in my New Yorker memoirs, we were followed all over Europe by 60 members of the Yale Glee Club. Uh, <laughs> And it was not alone that they had liked and admired us, but we were living in very posh hotel quarters, and they were staying in, in pension, and they had no bathrooms in those days. And so they all would come, and as we were lying in bed contentedly in the morning, they would come streaming through our room to take baths and showers. And in one hotel in Munich, the manager called me aside in a rage because uh, somehow or other, to his astonishment, this young American couple practicing he didn't know what unnatural sexual activity uh, had succeeded in using up all the hot water in the hotel. <laughs> it was in Munich, too, that, that uh, uh, an event took place which manages to link uh, the Whiffenpoofs and Hitler. And I would think that you could almost defy life to be so rich in its nature as to make it possible to think of the Whiffenpoofs and Hitler in the same moment. But uh, I recently saw uh, a movie in New York City uh, about Hitler, and it's seven and a half hours long. It's unendurably long and unendurably tiresome. It's a rotten movie. But in any event, the one thing that wasn't in that movie was an episode where the Whiffenpoofs were singing in the Rotskeller in Munich, and uh, Hitler called over my friend Merrill Knapp who was the head of the Whip and Poofs, and uh, congratulated him on their singing of uh, Aura Lee and to the tables down at Maury's. And can you think of Hitler hearing to the tables down at Maury's? In any event, I've always blamed Merrill since uh, for the Second World War, because uh, he had only to leap upon Hitler and strangle him with his bare hands. And uh, it would have cost him uh, nothing but his own life. Um, and so then I came, it was that fall that I came back and began writing short stories and so ended up uh, spending the rest of my life writing for The New Yorker. And uh, at that time, it was truly, I suppose, more nearly a humorous magazine than it is now. It was certainly founded as a humorous magazine in 1925. And at that time, America had lots of humorous magazines. It was Life at that time was a humorous magazine and Judge and Puck and oh, there were maybe 10 college humor. There were 10 very po popular and successful novel uh, magazines that were considered humorous magazines. And so there was nothing special about Ross starting The New Yorker, except that he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and uh, he kept fumbling in, in, about uh, for the first year or two, wondering how to make a humorous magazine. He himself was an extraordinary roughneck uh, out of Aspen, Colorado, and a miner's son. And, uh, he is reputed never to have finished a book. He never finished reading a single book in his life, but he was the occasion for many books being written. And uh, it was also famously said of him that he had once put a query on a galley of a piece of one of our early pieces uh, having to do with Moby Dick asking the question, is Moby Dick the man or the fish? And uh, <laughs> when, 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 when I went to work there, uh, he, he and, uh, he said to Sean, the then managing editor, the present editor, Ross's successor, 25 years ago after Ross's death, uh, Ross said to Sean, Gill hasn't suffered enough. That was his simplistic view of where writing came from. And uh, Sean and I agreed that anybody who reached the age of three uh, has suffered enough for all practical purposes. <laughs> um, that, that, that early New Yorker was uh, crudely and simply funny. Uh, the pieces were very brief. Uh, the, none, none of them uh, was more than a page long, and uh, uh, the writer was not of great importance at the magazine, and, and even the pieces which were thought to be humorous were little skittish, uh, sketchy pieces. Uh, there was nothing of any sustained uh, flight, and certainly nothing intellectual. And, uh, what happened over the years was that a remarkable woman, Catherine White, uh, came uh, married uh, to E.B. White, 
uh, became sort of the intellectual conscience of the magazine, and she turned it from being simply a magazine full of sometimes successful and sometimes unsuccessful jokes into a magazine uh, with some pretension to, uh, to, to intellectual distinction and to the uh, discovery of, uh, of good fiction and good poetry in America. But the big change in the magazine and why it became less uh, a humorous magazine uh, than it would otherwise have been was, of course, the Second World War. Famously, uh, S.N. Berman named one of his comedies at that time, one of the plays, the last play before the war, uh, No Time for Comedy. And one felt that very strongly. And with the war came also what we have to think of as, as the triumph of fact over, over, over fiction. More and more since the Second World War, Americans have been eager to read factual material and much less eager to read fiction. The, 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 the truth seems to be that life uh, became so astonishing in its violence and in the, uh, the unexpectedness of the events uh, that, 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 that we have lived through uh, those of my generation, that no fiction uh, could any longer hope uh, to prove to be a successful rival uh, to such events, for example, as, uh, as Hiroshima or uh, Auschwitz. Uh, what on earth could anybody imagine that would match uh, in horror uh, events of that kind? And so more and more, uh, we turned in the magazine to the writing of fact, uh, factual material, and, and less and less uh, to uh, works of what I would think of as, uh, as the imagination. And uh, uh, whether this was good or bad, it was a necessity to us, it happened. Uh, only poetry was able to uh, avoid this, was able to outwit this, uh, because the, and the poem, the kind of poetry that came into existence in America after the Second World War uh, was no longer uh, the formal poetry of before the war, but it was what is now called confessional poetry. It was the howling of individuals. It was the anguish of personal expression which came into poetry and has been in poetry ever since the Second World War. We hear uh, the, the voice of the poet uttering uh, something of great moment to him, and it is not a narrative poem. It isn't a formal organization of events out there. It is something inward to outward that the poet gives us. So poetry survived, and fiction, alas, uh, has had a difficult time, at least in magazines. And uh, in the same way, humor in magazines has had a difficult time for the, for the succeeding uh, 25 years after the war. People complained to us about the shortage of humor in the magazine, and they continue to do so. Uh, but we, of necessity, became a magazine of information and uh, of opinion, and even of, I would say, morality uh, rather than wit. Uh, because as things darkened here on the, uh, at home in regard to certain major issues, uh, like Vietnam or Watergate or those things, the magazine felt obliged uh, to, to deal with those materials, and there was very little of humor to deal with uh, when, you, when you entered that particular arena. Uh, over the past few years, we had a few rare exceptions among uh, 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 the writers who have written for the magazine, and of course the leading exception is that remarkable person, uh, Woody Allen, who loves to write for the New Yorker magazine, uh, which of course pays him very little, and given uh, how much uh, uh, money he is able to make in other fields, uh, uh, it's plain that, that the magazine represents something of a kind of home to him, a place that he's proud uh, to be related to. And he himself uh, writes a kind of humor which is the nearest to the kind of humor uh, that Robert Benchley he used to write of anybody that has come along since Bensley. There's a kind of uh, intrinsic uh, sweetness of nature uh, in Allen's humorous pieces in The New Yorker. Uh, there's less sweetness of nature in his movies, but in the pieces that he writes for The New Yorker, there was a kind of sweetness uh, that reflects exactly the same attitude toward life and to oneself as a writer writing about life uh, that Bensley uh, manifested. And uh, I always look forward to great excitement to, to seeing any piece by him uh, in, in the magazine. And uh, just in the last uh, two or three years, there have been more humorous pieces being written in the magazine by young folk than have been able to be written, evidently, in the last 20 years. So something is happening out in the world 
that is making humor come back into the world. And uh, this is happening not only on The New Yorker as a magazine and in other magazines of humor, but it's happening uh, in the theater. Because for years in the theater, we have been a very short supply of uh, humor. And now, uh, young writers in the theater, writers in their 20s and early 30s, uh, are all writing comedies. And it's fascinating to speculate on why this should be. There's uh, a, a new play in New York now called The Sorrows of Stephen by a young writer named Parnell that is very funny. There's another play that just opened last week in New York called Table Settings by a young writer named James Lapine. That too is very funny. And I suspect uh, that what may be happening is that we have consolidated whatever major changes in the nature of our society had been going on, whether subterraneously or on the surface over the last 20 years, and that perhaps, unbeknownst to us, there has come a kind of stabilization uh, in our society, which we yet haven't got the outlines of. And uh, in, 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 uh, I see this happening in all kinds of unexpected ways. I had been predicting a few years ago uh, certainly that, uh, that marriage was a disappearing institution. It seemed to me there was no evidence that marriage could possibly survive uh, uh, the uh, attitudes that we now had developed toward each other. Uh, and, uh, and yet this year, everybody I know in New York is getting married. Who, people who have been living together for 10 years, 15 years, have suddenly, it's like an infection. It's like some uh, extraordinary uh, uh, disease that is sweeping uh, New York City, so that uh, every day of the week there's another marriage taking place. Well, I think that perhaps this is linked, at least on a short range uh, level, with uh, the return to comedy. That if, uh, <laughs> if, if, if uh, we are beginning to form a society which, uh, that, uh, that has an outline, that has a regularity to it, uh, then comedy begins to emerge, because comedy consists of an attitude uh, usually uh, adverse to, but in, uh, but, uh, uh, in relationship to uh, a stable society. You get your Goldsmiths and your Sheridans and your Congreves uh, when there is something to make fun of in a stable society. You don't get comedians or humorous writers or humorous dramatists when uh, a country is in a state of revolution. And so uh, this was true of Bernard Shaw as a playwright making his comedies out of his opposition to the status quo in England in his day. It certainly was true uh, among Joyce, uh, for Joyce, uh, among writers, uh, certainly the greatest uh, humorous novel of the 20th century, uh, the great comic novel of our century is, is Ulysses, and that was a novel which is a comedy because it is laid in the most conventional circumstances of the most provincial city imaginable, which is Dublin. Uh, the therapy uh, of humor is practiced uh, inside a society that seems to begin to know what it is and what it needs. Uh, the greatest living playwright, Sam Beckett, is also uh, a great humorous writer. And, and uh, uh, he is so great that uh, he is outside most of the society that I've been talking about. But, uh, and his humor is directed uh, at the nature of the human predicament itself, of the catastrophe, uh, from his point of view, of being alive. He, he takes, in the great tradition of Twain and Lardner and others, the view that life is so dreadful that uh, only humor uh, is possible. He, he, he rejects the tragic view as, as uh, uh, as are not being worthy of, as something we're not worthy of. Uh, the cry in one of his plays, I can't go on, I'll go on. That's what he, that's what he says. And uh, we recently had uh, in New York his play Endgame. And I'd like to, nothing gives a writer greater pleasure than to quote himself. So if you'll forgive me, give me my pleasure. Let me quote myself. This is on Samuel Beckett's Endgame at the Manhattan Theater Club. It was written well over 20 years ago when Beckett was a vigorous man in early middle age. But the play strikes a characteristically valedictory note 
and its occasional comic touches serve only to emphasize the bleak circumstances out of which they emerge. Beckett, in effect, rewrites Newman's hymn to, lead, to read, lead on kindly light amid the encircling gloom. The night is dark and there isn't any home. Ham, the protagonist of Endgame, is a sick, tetchy, immobilized blind man who keeps pleading with his servant, Clove, to be given his painkiller. Clove, too, is sick in body and mind. The bond between the two is a reiterated lack of love, as between an estranged father and son, heightened by a conviction that nothing any longer exists outside the squalid quarters they inhabit. Ham is certainly old, but not yet an orphan. In two ash bins at one side of the stage are confined his senile parents, Nag and Nell, who cackle of a lost happiness from their impromptu tombs. The play begins with Ham removing a blood-stained handkerchief, old stancher, from his puffy red face, and it ends with his putting the handkerchief back. Among the last words he utters are, you cried for night, it falls, now cry in darkness. One is put in mind of the heartbreaking final pages of Finnegan's Wake, but then Beckett at once mockingly adds, as no doubt Joyce would have done, nicely put that. And then of another play, a world premiere of a little tiny play by Beckett was given uh, down at the La Mama Theater in, in, uh, in New York uh, just at the end of the year. And it's a play that he calls A Piece of Monologue. And I'd just like to quote a little of what I said about that uh, play because it has to do with Beckett and, and uh, with humor. Everything exists in the present in history. And I ought to mention as a footnote to history that the world premiere of a new work by Samuel Beckett was given at La, at La Mama in late December. With appropriate Beckett-like irony, its brief run ended just as the new year began. The first line of the work is, birth, birth was the death of him. The title, A Piece of Monologue, contains a pun, the piece being not only a portion of something, but also the French word for play. The monologue was written for Beckett's friend, the actor David Warlow, who recited it very slowly indeed, with many a parturient silence over a period of 50 minutes. The text would cover in print a scant three or four pages, and an actor of higher velocity than Mr. Warlow might well have given it in 15 or 20 minutes. Not that I consider the Warlow method with Beckett an unwise one. Especially in Beckett's present phase, Every word he sets down must appear to have been minted on the spot, and so to be eyed with uncertainty, like a gold coin cooling. Are we to laugh or cry? The question is one that this most nomic of writers refuses to grant us the least tip of the tail of an answer to. The Irish are thought to be merry because they commit so readily the mortal sin of despair. There is surely the laughter of hopelessness in hell, and no laughter at all in heaven. But in Beckett's case, I think he is merry because he is merry. And his plays are often misdirected and misunderstood because people are too quick to seek out the gloom in them instead of the hints, however elusive, of joy. Quickly turn away. Moreover, he is doubly at a distance from us, a figure on a stage describing a figure on a stage. I have passed much of my life among men who grew maudlin with age, and I marvel, as evidently Beckett does, at what an appetite for living remains undiminished in them, even as their bones turn to limestone and their minds to jelly. It is a subject no artist can fail to be drawn to and depict in no matter how disguised a form. Well, that's a long way from the New Yorker magazine, except as a quotation. But it deals, uh, I think, as directly as we can with the question of uh, why humor exists. I think we see in Beckett what a necessity it is for him in his dark view uh, that he practices this always in a shorter and shorter and shorter form until you think that silence is going to be the last work of art 
he commits. Plainly, as you've probably been told many times before in this conference, uh, humor, uh, like all manifestations of art, is man's heroic attempt to outwit the unendurable fact of death. We know what we face and we cannot face it. We are not resigned. We have only two ways of outwitting death children and art. And of these, art is perhaps for some of us uh, the more satisfactory. I have had the happiest life of anyone I know, and I intend to leave it with a semblance of good cheer, however reluctant or angry or disappointed I may feel. And perhaps I keep hoping that I will be able to imitate Oscar Wilde in this uh, a man so profligate, both of his talent and of himself, that he left two deathbed statements instead of one. <laughs> you probably remember both of them. He was dying in Paris and in a hotel room with hideous wallpaper. And he said, speaking directly to the wallpaper, either you go or I go. <laughs> And then he said, at the very end, I am dying as I have lived beyond my means. That would suit me very nicely. I shouldn't leave you all together in, 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 in the depths of the gloom of our necessary fate uh, and try to strike a somewhat sunnier note before, if you like, uh, we could turn uh, to question and answers, because I love answering questions. And when I don't know something, I improvise. Uh, I would like to just tell one anecdote, final anecdote, uh, which concerns the New Yorker or our staff or part of our staff. And it's true uh, that uh, as uh, the magazine grows older, it's now 55 years old, necessarily there are people who uh, have written for that magazine for many years and who are dying at a quickening rate of speed. The only thing that is quickening about us is the speed of our deaths. And uh, we have now obituaries in the magazine far too often for, for the magazine's own good, as far as I'm concerned. There's a wonderful obituary in the New Yorker this week, written by Sean, our editor, who never has written anything under his own name. This is an anonymous obituary of St. Clair McElway. Who, who was the man who hired me uh, all those years ago and uh, gave me a job uh, at $35 a week. And when he told Ross that he had done this, Ross said, don't play God, McElway. <laughs> but by that time, he had played God, and there I was. And uh, McElway, uh, son of generations of Presbyterian ministers, was always uh, desperately uh, infatuated with women, and uh, he came eventually to be known as Marry the Girl McElway, you know, because uh, he married five or six times, always unsuccessfully. Uh, he was a manic depressive, and it was one of the wonders uh, of, of what the artist is, that out of the misery of, of, of that dreadful condition, uh, he, he turned, uh, he found humor, he invented art, out of his own sickness again and again. Um, at one point uh, during the Second World War uh, in the South Pacific, he began to go mad. And his madness took the form of, of course, euphoria, joy. He felt wonderful. And uh, he decided that Chester Nimitz, who was SYNCPAC, he was the head of the whole Allied effort in the South Pacific, that Chester Nimitz uh, was, in, was a super spy in the employ of the Japanese. And so uh, McElway wrote a letter to the, uh, to the Defense Department, and to the War Department in Washington, accusing Chester Nimitz of high treason. And uh, just by good fortune, the, the letter reached the desk of a friend of McElway, who had a lot of power, and who sent word that that man must be returned to the country at once. And uh, he was placed in an asylum. And, uh, and uh, Nimitz, uh, when he was apprised of this accusation, found it fortunately for McElway amusing rather than serious. 
uh, later in Edinburgh, he wrote a book called The Edinburgh Caper, a very witty, funny book about the time he went mad in Edinburgh. And he began to read uh, the license plates of automobiles, and he could see the letters and numbers. He, f he found a code in them, and it was a plot on the part of the Russians to kidnap the queen. And uh, McElway took all that seriously and, 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 uh, uh, and made out of that dreadful episode uh, a funny, a funny book. The police commissioner in New York, uh, Francis Adams, no longer police commissioner, he was a friend of McElway's at a club in New York, and McElway, when he would begin to go mad, would begin to take over this man's work, and he got so he would telephone Francis Adams in the middle of the night, and uh, there was a particular murder in, in, in New York, the Rubenstein murder case, a man who was murdered, they never found the murderer, and McElway, in his madness, would telephone Adam saying, I've broken the Rubenstein case. <laughs> and, uh, oh, poor man. Anyway, uh, you will read, if you read the New Yorker this week, you'll read that beautiful piece by, by Sean on, on McElway. But that isn't a reason that we should develop this new art form of obituary to, to, because uh, <laughs> it's going to become tiresome for our readers. But this is my episode, my anecdote uh, is about a wonderful old writer on the New Yorker named Captain Ryle, who did the racetrack column. He was called Audax Minor. And uh, uh, he began writing for us in middle age, so we finally, he was finally retired in his dotage at about 91. And uh, he didn't know whether he was coming or going, poor man. And uh, his, his work had always been edited in the magazine by, another, uh, by an editor named Hobart Weeks. So Weeks died. And then about a year later, poor Captain Ryle called up from whatever rest home he was living in and said that he wanted to add a final word to his racetrack column that week at Christmas, wishing all his readers a Merry Christmas. And the young editor at least had the wit to say, yes, of course we'll do that, uh, Captain Ryle, although the column hadn't appeared in, by that time, two or three years. And, uh, and, and uh, then Captain Ryle said, and if you don't, do that right. He said, I'll get after my friend Hobie Weeks and make sure it's done right. And the young editor unfortunately blurted out, but, but, but uh, Captain Ryle, Mr. Weeks has been dead for over a year now. And there was a silent, uh, silence at the other end of the phone. And then Captain Ryle said, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> I think that's a splendid story. <laughs> I really and truly would love to answer some questions. Has anybody got any questions? Yes. 